Hello and welcome to this session on module three on risk management. Um, maybe another one after this, but um, with the subject being quite a broad area, and I'm hoping that it's an area that you already know because of the work that you have in your jobs and the experience that you've had at level six and level seven. But nevertheless, for those who are quite new to this, um, I'll be going through some of the legislation and background to it. Uh, for those who are already experienced in it, well, you can sit back and perhaps have a laugh at me in terms of what we're trying to cover. So, um, for this particular module, there's quite a lot involved in it, but it obviously it's about risk assessment and risk management, and then how that's used by the safety person, safety board, to uh, make changes within the workplace so that the risks, whether they be financial, reputational, or otherwise, as well as health and safety risks, they're taken on board and acted upon. Um, perhaps the last uh, couple there, where you look at the developing awareness on the role of the scientist or engineer in relation to risk in society is kind of a, an interesting one. Um, so let's take uh, COVID as the classic example of this and how we've used and perhaps question the scientists uh, when they've appeared on the television to show um, where they are now, what they've done so far, and where they want to go with controlling the, the viral spread. But uh, also on the engineering side, should we say, perhaps um, looking at further afield, maybe as a result of Grenfell, for example, the engineering side of fire risk management will improve, uh, not just on the building, uh, regulations, which I think is not far reaching enough, but perhaps uh, compartmentation, for example, within buildings and um, controlling fire spread by, by other means, such as suppression systems and likes of. So scientists and engineers and the part that they play, uh, and in this particular case, links to society, uh, will perhaps come separate to this at a later, later stage. Uh, hopefully you've already received your assignments and uh, you'll see that this is a work-based project mainly around risk management. So again, when I talk about uh, duties, responsibilities and where it comes from, I'm trying to put it into context with starting with the management regs and then coming back to it later on, but linking it to legislation and how the Health and Safety Work Act came about and the history behind legislation as well. So there's a little bit more than just getting to know uh, the, the risk assessment side of things. Uh, further in the session, I'm going to talk a lot about suitable and sufficient risk assessments and even use a couple of case examples whereby uh, people have been prosecuted and it seems to be because they've not been detailed enough within the risk assessment process and their approach to managing that risk that tends to make them fall down. Um, within the regulation three of the management regs, it specifies review. And again, this seems to come up time and time again with uh, you know people who want to question it, but let's say the enforcing authorities. So any assessment as such needs to be reviewed when it's no longer valid. I think that's the easiest way to describe it, but also if there's any significant changes. Um, in some companies and some, some manners of, of risk management, it could be once every year or it could be once every three years. Um, the guidance advises don't let it go longer than five years. But um, in some cases, it could be daily. You know, if you're working with mobile elevated work platforms and you're planning a lift under the LOLA regulations and the worker height regulations, like literally every time you're doing that risk or exposing people to that risk, it could be a daily occurrence where you're viewing it. Similarly with construction sites and the fluidity of the changes on construction sites, uh, where you might have uh, having your traffic plan that this is the direction that people have to take, or this is the transport management arrangements going around site. And then the following day, because they're using raw materials and they're moving them from one place to another, uh, you then have to revise your traffic management. And as a result of that, you're reviewing your control measures and ultimately your risk assessments as well. Um, special cases, you know, the people who are more vulnerable, there's, um, there used to be their own regulation for young people and also pregnant females. 
And as a result of that, when it was incorporated in the, in the revised version of the management regulations in 1999, it then says, let's take the old young person's regs and absorb it within the management regs because we're trying to deregulate. So why not do something about it? And it's the very nature and activities associated with risk that make young people more vulnerable. And therefore, for that reason, we need to do more to control that risk. So anyone who's under the age of 18 is classed a young person, whether on work experience, on an apprenticeship or otherwise, all of that is pulled together to try and identify what needs to be in place. Uh, and so because of this, we need, we need to just make sure that we don't put those vulnerables uh, at risk. And, you know, with, with young people, there's certain things that have been taking place for a long, long time. And as a result of that, like, like using a bacon slicer, uh, as an example, you know, and, and the fact that it's always been a banned activity for a young person because if they try to do it, they cut their hands off, of course. Well, it's never that bad, but there's been case examples that meant that because somebody uh, who was young, immature, and the approach to risk perhaps wasn't the right one, has led to everybody being tarred with the same brush, and therefore it's expanded to physical, biological, chemical, chemical agents and certain work equipment and activities that just can't use. Now, sometimes like a, a use of a chainsaw, you'll say, well, if they're a bit immature, I don't want anybody picking it up a chainsaw and having a go with it. Um, so you can see sometimes, but I know young people that are very mature, have the right attitude towards this, but just not allowed because the risk assessments won't let them. So you can see both sides of the argument. However, um, let's just accept that that's the law. It's a must because the level of duty here is, um, you know, strict liability and therefore it has to be done. So what we're saying is you can't take on a young person without doing a risk assessment. So as soon as they start work in whatever capacity, a risk assessment for a young person has to be done. Regulation 16, risk assessment in terms of new mothers and expectant mothers. Now, I, I just want to pause there. To, it's important that you decipher the two. It's not just the fact that you do a risk assessment three times when uh, a pregnant female or for a pregnant female. So at the beginning of trimester one, trimester two, and then trimester three. It's not just that. It's also that that particular um, mother wants now to continue after having the baby and returning back after maternity to to actually breastfeed for example and therefore what facilities do you have available to encourage the privacy of somebody to be able to do breastfeeding they're not going to bring the baby into work they might do if you're that open but unlikely that they're going to bring the baby into work so what they want to do is go to a private area where they can have access to a fridge where they can use the breast pump and having done that they can put it into a fridge and it'll be labeled as as breast milk and then at the end of the day it's taken up over home and the baby can use that milk you know so you can see about this is not just a little bit of a tick box exercise there's a lot involved in that regulation that stipulates it has to be done again top so there's you can't avoid it it's an absolute duty it must be done so interesting how many companies forget this though and then they don't have anything in place afterwards for the for the breastfeeding mother which i find really strange so with my experience it's a dedicated room that you provide and if it is a pregnant female i would rather have that pregnant female at work coming in late or if they if they'd rather come to work and they might be suffering in the first semester um let's say um, morning sickness is a big issue for them, why not let them go into a relaxing room where they can put their head down for half an hour. When they feel sick, they get up, they go to the uh, bucket or usually it's a toilet, a clean hygienic area, nevertheless, where it can be cleaned again afterwards. And then having done and been sick, should we say, then cleaning themselves up and putting their head down for another 15, 20 minutes. And then after maybe an hour, they're back at work. So think about it that way in terms of if it's an eight hour day or an eight hour shift that they're doing, but they're not only able for one hour 
then put the facilities in place so that they can do that. So that's what I'm saying there about managing that particular risk. And again, it really annoys me that many companies don't go down this, this area of provision. <clears throat> so it says shall. So it's an absolute duty. You can't get around it. Um, there are variations on this. You need to have a, a medical practitioner, first of all, explaining that this person is in fact um, pregnant. And then you, you start from that point of knowledge. Once you know that they are in fact pregnant and it's been confirmed by a certificate or a note from the GP, then you can then do the risk assessment. Now, within the risk assessment, there are certain jobs, just like the young person, because they are vulnerable, then you have to make changes. And think of it from, you know, disabled kind of thing. If you did something for a disabled person or maybe in managing a condition, a health condition, when they come back to work, you've got to manage them back into work without aggravating the condition same kind of approach here as much as it's not condition it's part of life as such and many pregnant females have argued with me in some cases the extension of the duty here is to look after the unborn child and sometimes the their approach to risk is not the same as it should be so it the emphasis is on the employer to make sure that that person doesn't put themselves and the unborn child at risk so, for example, one, can, one uh, issue I had to deal, deal with was a pregnant female working on the shop floor that was, had a bad back, and then she got pregnant. When she was pregnant, it was pushing on her back, and there was more potential, should we say, for her to have injuries. And uh, because of that risk, I then put her on light duties, and within the light duties, I explained what she could, but also explained what she couldn't do. Whilst she was working on the shop floor, doing a light duty activity, she pulled her back and then we had to get the ambulance in. And when the ambulance came in, she said, oh, I'll be back on site in a couple of hours. Don't worry about it. And I said, no, you won't. You'll not be back until at least tomorrow. And if you do come back, we're going to review your risk assessment. So again, it's the, there's this management of attitude towards risk that becomes part of what we try to do to make sure that the, the mother, but also the unborn child is looked after. So altering work conditions is a typical approach, maybe reducing the hours that they work, maybe suspending them from work or even rearranging things so they can attend appointments um, and ultimately less risk. <clears throat> so reference to risk in relation to risk from any infectious or contagious disease, or it could be substances that are exposed to that could be uh, damaging, should we say, to unborn children. So again, you look at COSH, um, your cost assessment sheets, and it will maybe determine that some substances they can't be exposed to. So moving on then, another key thing about the management regs was, was recording, and it's been discussed uh, a lot in the legislation interpretation, but particularly when we look at suitable and sufficient risk assessments, um, it says that if you have more than five employees, then you have to record it. Fair enough. But the variation on that is what if you're a, yacht, a small or micro enterprise and you have less than five people, but you go to work for a principal contractor, you go onto their site, and then the overall arching controls are necessary. And therefore, that company will say, I want your RAMs, I want your risk assessments and method statements if you are coming working on my site. So what they're saying is collectively, there are more than four employees working on this project. Therefore, we should have a risk assessment recorded. And by having a policy in place that dictates that, it allows the opportunity for at least to be discussed and then become part of the risk management process. Well, the legal requirements, there's a link to, you know, the management regs themselves, but there's also the other piece of legislation that are out there. there are, it's implicit part within the, the manner of such. And they may not be discussed or classified as risk assessments, but nevertheless, they are in, in many ways. A manual handling risk assessment is needed under the management regs. PPE regulations require the thought process around making it suitable and the right type of personal protective equipment. And as much as it's not saying do a risk assessment, it is part of it to make sure that the control measure that we are using is, is effective and therefore PPE regulations as an indirect link to risk assessments, even though it's low in the priority or the hierarchy of controls. Displaced green equipment 
um, doing a workstation risk assessment and then homeworking as such, and then the links to stress and so on and so forth. The, the issues around the way that we work uh, having implications on mental health, but also musculoskeletal disorders. Um, noise regulations. It says do a measurement of the noise and then identify who is at risk. And once you know that there is an element of noise that's going to be uh, potentially hazardous to health, i.e. causing deafness or hearing impairment or hearing conditions, you then have to do a risk assessment and implement further controls. COSH, same kind of thing. We call them COSH assessments, but ultimately it is a risk assessment on the use of a substance or hazardous agent and therefore the impact it has on people. So all of these have pieces of legislation, should we say, that in, in them are implicit. Superimposed upon the management regs is the need to make specific risk assessments on those areas. Now, I want to move on a little bit. I did mention at the beginning that I think it's only right to talk about Here's a little bit of the history um, associated <coughs> excuse me, with uh, risk management and risk assessment. So if you go back many hundreds of years in the early 19th century, when we started to get the, um, this kind of moving from the Victorian age and becoming in more of this village environment and then turning that into this foundries and factories and so on, that industrial revolution led to changes and thought processes. And I've got the picture there of children working on the sewing machines where if one of the looms was dropped, uh, below the sewing machine, they would be asked to slide underneath and try and pick it, pick it out and pull them out. And children working in these workhouses for 15 hours a day, you know, they had sleeping quarters that were on site um, and it, it just became their life till eventually people realised that this, from a moral perspective, is not correct. And therefore, the Education Act came in, but also these restrictions were put in place around that to try and contain and prevent those risks. Um, so we had in 1802 the Health and Morals Apprentices Act, which stipulates limitations on time and night work being prevented. And then it moved on, you know, children under the age, the age of nine to work in mills and factories and limiting the working hours. It seems shocking to even consider that now, but again, somebody's thought about the level of risk and the impact it has on people, in this particular case, vulnerable children. And therefore it leads on from that to making changes. So as you see, we've had many variations on the old Factories Act and uh, even the different types of workplaces with different acts that help us to understand this. But ultimately it leads us nicely towards the Health and Safety at Work Act. Um, a bit, well, let's say before 1974 and after 1961, when we had the Factories Act um, and also the Offices, Shops and Railway Premises Act in uh, 63. So all these developments came about were, let's say they were too prescriptive. So the Robins Committee paid, came together in the 1970 specifically to address this. And then ultimately the changes came about from the Health and Safety at Work Act. Now, within that title, it's got the term etc. And that makes it an enabling act. Now, just looking at the health and safety executive timeline, if you want to go back into history and find more about each of these changes, you can see it's an interesting read to try and find out what took place and how it came about. So the Health and Safety at Work Act tried to change some of the overly complex absolute terms that were in the Factories Act and the Office of Shops and Railway Premises Act. Like every year you had to whitewash the walls in a factory. Well, why? Why does a factory have to be cleaned to that extent where, where painting on the wall was considered a safety issue? Um, it was just at that time that people thought um, something that looked white and quite clean was more likely to, to be well managed from a risk perspective. So removing some of the, um, that et cetera bit, making it enabling, helped us to quantify uh, the level of risk. And as a result of that quantification, it also handed it over more to the employer. And the employer could then interpret best way to interpret within their company to apply the specific controls that best meets their needs. So as a result of that, there was a changing 
expectation, should we say, but also a self-policing approach from this enabling act. And that self-policing approach allows us to take account of variations on a theme rather than being led by law. So Robin's committee came together and as a result of that made some superb changes um, in, in the way forward. So the Enabling Act means that the Health and Safety at Work Act, although still used now from 1974, still has the and does the job well because it focuses on the general duties, section two through to section nine. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it sets the framework and that's the key thing. Once you've got the framework, you can build on it with other bits and pieces. The other bits and pieces were local regulations and special regulations so that you can get the generality under the Enabling Act and then it will be supported by specific regulations. And as industry changes and our methods are learned and different um, impacts, should we say, associated with, with a variety of risks, you can then implement new changes. So let's look at the work at height regulations. Only brought in place 2005, you know, some 30 years after the 1974 regulation, uh, 1974 Act, but nevertheless, they both work hand in hand. And maybe we'll get something in the not too distant future. Another change in a, in a new regulation, because perhaps that hadn't been covered before, and it's not, we can't rely on the generality of the management regulations and the generality of the Health and Safety Work Act. So we've got to have something more specific. I'm hoping one example of that will be around health in, and look at some of the specific health conditions in or occupationally related health conditions that we might get some changes in legislation as, as a result of that. For example, mental health and stress. Um, perhaps we now need to realize that as number one, for keeping people off work, that perhaps it needs to be more specific to what employers have to do to control that particular risk. Now, the uh, the Act itself, with it being Health and Safety at Work Act um, 1974, also made it cover all kinds of occupations. So we didn't need the Factories Act, we didn't need the Offices, Shops and Railway Premises Act, and then worry about all the others that were missed. It's all encompassing for all workplaces. Um, it covers public protection, so how public interact with workplaces, visitors, uh, going into shops, etc. that previously that wasn't covered by older legislation. So the, the unification of the inspectorates literally was um, everybody knowing their place and the local authority links. And so you've got the environmental health officer, you've got the health and safety executive inspector, you've got the fire brigade and so on. They can all work collectively together or independently now as a result of these joint resources. Uh, a framework that was in place for criminal enforcement, so there was less chance, should we say, for people to get away by not complying with their general duties. Um, improvement notices and prohibition notices were introduced as part of the inspector's responsibilities, and that way they could reduce the amount of time and effort put into getting people into court, because these notices would allow you to take action to control the risk. So a lot done at that time by Robins, and 1974 Act was considered to be a great step forward. Um, and a lot of companies like the idea or employers like the idea of the fact that it was self-policing. Um, however, it did lead to some gaps. How do you interpret risk and how do you apply best practice? So as a result of that, we had to think about what would be in place that would best suit and fill that gap. So uh, the Act itself covers a, a decent framework the preliminary section moves on to the duties, the general duties, and the general duties are under section two to section nine. It attempts to cover every type of person uh, or role involved in, um, in, in the place of work. Then you've got how we do it from an administrative point of view, um, 10 to 18. And then you've got the powers of the inspector and the enforcement activities from sections 19 through to 25, and then variations on a theme associated with offences in, in section 33 on, onwards. Um, but I particularly like section 40, where it, it transfers that duty, um, where in all other 
uh, forms of prosecution and enforcement, the person is innocent until proved guilty. As a result of this change, should we say, under Section 40, the defendant, the employer, in most cases, has to prove that they did everything possible within their powers to make it as safe as it needed to be uh, to prevent serious accidents and, and dangerous occurrences. Now, that for me is great because it means, you know, it's an uncomfortable moment for an employer to prove that, but it gives us as safety practitioners a little bit more strength, should we say, in terms of our argument to be able to say, okay, well, if you ever end up in court, um, I'll be happy to support you, but I've got records here that indicate that you made decisions based on financial and budgetary constraints. You decided not to spend that money. And as a result of that, um, it put more people at risk. And as a result of that, this incident took place. So you can see the links there as to where we're going from and to. So that aspect of um, self uh, enforcement requires perhaps the the directors the employers to fully appreciate the variations on that and also the guidance the codes of practice and the information that's out there to help them to comply so it's a nice picture there of healer and then moving upwards from the government and how it links to it so you've got the health and safety commission that it splits the health and safety executive and local authorities but they actually come together under healer and i think that's a great idea so you can share best practice and also have a standardised approach, should we say, to how um, health and safety can be legislated and enforced and implemented in practice. So great in that respect. Uh, the Commission set out the goals and objectives, and from that, the Act helps to stipulate what we want in the workplace, but it also encourages best practice and also it looks at how they can influence and support. So as you can see from the duties, uh, of the commission, they look at promotion, they look at encouraging research, giving information and training services, which is something that initially the HSC didn't want to do because they felt that if they told someone how to do it in a specific way, it might go against them in a court of law. But now they're much more open and they give you the information to help you interpret so that um, it is more obvious, you know, it is more black and white, should we say, well, according to the court of practice, this is what we expected to be done, you should have matched that standard, and in our interpretation, you haven't, so it's easier for them to enforce, where initially they were a little bit overly conservative about that, um, but nevertheless, you can see how a commission was put together to try and get the best uh, out of these situations associated with health and safety. And ultimately, it supports the duties. Now, shortly after the Act, we also had the, uh, the health and safety, should we say, for safety representatives and, and, and employees. You know, how do you do that? Even that was considered. And then they put in new legislation to make that supportive of, of the Health and Safety Act itself. But you can see here, they've got a good... Uh, relationship, should we say, rather than it just be the government, they've also got industry specialists, they've got uh, people from employment, so they can give advice that way, and you've got duty holders themselves that help to, to put this in place. So ultimately, it's rather than pointing the finger and say, you must do it this way, it's kind of like a more engaging approach. The principles that they put in place about these demarcation based on those three principles, allocation of premises, based on the concept of the main activity carried out. So that goes back to, if you think about the fire regulations initially, they used to say when you needed a fire certificate, they would always ask, what is the purpose of this premise? Now you can now change the purpose of the premise, but you need to notify them so they can then identify the level of risk. So let's say welding is one of the key things, topics that need to be managed now because of the cancer uh, risks, lung cancer from using mild steel welding rods as an example. Um, if you've registered, uh, as you have to as an employer, the, the purpose of the premise, then as a result of that, if there's a change in that purpose, they'll be notified. So perhaps 10 years ago, you didn't do welding, and now you do. So you let them know. And as a result of that being on a register, it sends an inspector out to check that you're compliant with your extraction, your on-tool extraction, your health surveillance, your risk management of welding as an example. So they need to be notified of what the purpose of the premise is, so that then they can make sure they manage that. Similarly, high-risk environments that have to comply with COMA regulations, 
classic example there. You register and you apply for a license. In your notification of wanting to get a license, they can weigh up the risk. And as a result of that, come on site and evaluate what more needs to be done, if anything, to make sure you take the health and safety side of it seriously. Um, dual inspection, they're trying to avoid that so they can standardise their approach. Because if, if one person comes along and says something and then somebody changes their mind further on, it, it really does cause confusion. So again, avoiding dual inspection. Then finally, there should be no self-inspection by enforcing it authorities. So again, going back to HeLa and sharing a best practice, it meant then that there was a more collective approach and improvement in the standardisation of it. Now, in criminal proceedings, the burden of proof, as I mentioned before, typically would be that you are innocent until proved guilty. However, as I mentioned, as a result of Section 40, this changed somewhat. So if the accused denies the charge, this doesn't impose a burden of proof on the accused, i.e. if the accused claims he did not kill the victim, it's still the prosecution who is required to provide that the accused did kill the victim. So that's the standard approach that we have for all other forms of legislation, criminal acts. Where the accused puts forward a defence which goes beyond a mere denial of prosecution, case and rises new, uh, raises new issues, then that in itself is a good defence. Then even so, the accused will not normally bear the legal burden of proof. Comes down to prosecution. And interestingly, the Crown Prosecution Service, they look at this to be evaluated and give advice to the police and other enforcing authorities to see whether the, the evidence that they have in place prior to trial is effective. They do the same with the health and safety executive as well. So consider that, that in parts of sections 17.3 of the Health and Safety Work Act and the links to codes of practice. And the codes of practice are the standard that you have to be seen to match or indeed exceed in your working practices to be able to say, that is my defense. So it has a special legal place or a code of practice as a special legal place. But as I mentioned before, section 40, it turns it on its head. The defendant must prove the defense on the balance of probabilities. The provision is called a reverse onus on or the reverse burden provision. So normally the burden of proof is on the prosecution to establish the facts beyond reasonable doubt. Here it rests with the accused and the standard of proof is on the balance of probabilities. Now going to the back to the fact that I wanted to link this to risk management, how else can you prove that you've done enough or you've done really well in your general risk management controls if you've not done risk assessments and made sure that those risk assessments are suitable and sufficient. And then once you've done the risk assessments, rather than it being in a file, in a cabinet, on a wall, people actually understand, apply and use that information to make sure that the control measures remain effective. So at this point, I always talk to people about under section two, one of the big ones is information, instruction, training. And then the fourth word is supervision. Information instruction training and then supervision. So if you've given them risk assessments and you've put control measures in place and you've written safe systems of work or method statements or otherwise, then how do you know that these employees are actually going to follow those rules unless you effectively supervise? So that's what I mean by my interpretation is showing that you're changing this burden of proof that you've done enough. Balance of probabilities means risk on one side, but not just the time, the inconvenience, the resources required and the budget to make it safe. But in fact, the behaviours are being monitored and managed by the supervisor, the line manager, or in some cases, the, uh, the actual health and safety board who goes around and does an inspections and audits to make sure that the manager complies with the bit of legislation. So please bear that in mind that guilty until the accused can prove otherwise. It's an important part, like I say, a good thing within the Health and Safety Work Act, because it now gives us as safety boards that little bit of power to cajole and support people. Now, you've got not just got it in Section 40 of the Health and Safety Work Act, you've also got it in Section 22, 26 of the Environmental Protection Act. And uh, the variation on that is BATNIC, so best available terms, not uh, 
exceeding excessive costs. So reasonably practicable is the health and safety world's approach. BATNIC is the uh, environmental's approach to it, but it still has that great standard. Yet um, they do not operate so as to make accused guilty until proven guilty. Still requires the prosecutors to establish beyond reasonable doubt but once proven, the accused will have to prove that they have done all that is reasonably practicable or bad. So there's those aspects that uh, mean that they have to sit up and listen. They have to take account of, of what we mean there. So the burden of proof is shifted to accused. They only need to prove to civil standard balance of probabilities that they have done all that is reasonably practicable. They don't have to prove that they're innocent. They just have to say, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. What more could I have done? I know we had an accident or a fatality. However, based on our approach and based on the industry standard and based on best practice, we feel we, we did, we matched that standard. It was just unfortunate that on the day, quite differently, the employee decided to do it differently and put themselves at risk. And as a result of that, they had the accident. Or it could well be that they don't put a good case forward. And it's quite easy to say, well, that's the industry standard and you're way, you're way below it. So this is not needed until prosecution have introduced a prima facie case against them. So what they'll say, <coughs> excuse me, what they'll say is that they have, uh, they believe they've got a very strong argument to prove the other wife. And therefore they'll still have that standard approach that police use where they are innocent until proven guilty. And they'll put all that information forward and therefore the evidence has to be shared between both parties. So there's no surprises in court on the day, uh, but ultimately it comes down, down to interpreting reasonably practicable. And like I say, keep coming back to risk assessment, risk management, that's what life is about, particularly in health and safety. So the presumption of in innocence was put in place and argued in 1998 in the Human Rights Act because it kind of saying, well, health and safety really is, is not taking account of this. However, throughout the web of English criminal law, one golden thread is always to be seen, that it is the duty of the prosecution to prove the person's guilt, no matter what the charge or were the trial, the principle that the prosecution must prove the guilt of the prisoner is part of the common law of England. Right? So that's the argument that put forward when the Human Rights Act was pushing this. And you can see why that is the case but we're allowed to show the balance of risk and reasonably practicable. And that's why it's so many pieces of legislation now, whether it's the act or it's the regulation, it specifies that term reasonably practical and gives you examples of what we mean by that. Okay, so I wanna move on now to, to link closely with that in terms of the key terms associated with risk assessment. So a hazard is something which has the potential to cause harm. Um, and whether I use a pillar drill, when I say there's a hole in the floor, or whether I use making a coffee with, you know, a, a coffee system that's there with, with a hot plate, there is an element of a, of a hazard there. So entanglement on the pillar drill, trip, hazard, and falling over from the hole in the floor and a hot plate there or picking up by the glass on the, on the vessel there could result in a burn. So the, the potential is there. Um, the other aspect of it is the hazardous events, because we need both of them to come together. We need the hazard to be in place, but we also need that hazardous event whereby humans typically are involved in doing something. And as a result of that, it created the risk. Yeah, so for a hazard to cause harm, there needs to be a hazardous event, usually involves the interaction with an individual. Now, the next stage we have to consider in terms of it's kind of a so what kind of approach in, in some respects, but we've got to take account of likelihood and then ultimately severity in our evaluation of risk. So likelihood is the chance that the hazard event, hazardous event will occur. Yeah. And what is that chance? And let's let's equate that and put some numerics against it or quantify it in some respects. The question I typically ask, is it likely that something can go wrong? And if it can go wrong, you know, Murphy's Law in some respects, it will go wrong. How likely is this? Yeah, so you could look at a variety of different hazards around that. For, for example, this gentleman here that's quite common, should we say, in the construction industry, who perhaps believes that silica dust 
is not really a hazard to him because he's working outside. And the great thing about working outside is I can still smoke my cigarette and therefore whilst I'm smoking, surely the dust is not going to get in my chest anyway. But silica dust is nasty and therefore the expectation in the industry and standard now is to have water damping system built into the tool so it sprays or somebody stood at the side with a water damp pump spray that will literally interact with the dust at source as they're commonly termed and as a result of that interaction at source it makes the dust heavier than air and can't be respirable. We can't breathe it in. And because we can't breathe it in, regardless of whether you're working a mask, wearing a mask or working outside, regardless of those factors, you're not going to result in, you know, cancer in 20 years time. But this attitude of I'm working outdoors and there's a bit of a breeze is not good enough. And therefore, how likely is it this man here is going to end up with some kind of lung disorder. There's a good chance, particularly the fact that he's smoking as well, where he's breaking down his resistance. So these factors are taken account of when we look at likelihood. And we can't just say stick a face mask on because when I talk about the hierarchy of controls later, personal protective equipment is down at the bottom in the hierarchy because we're relying on individuals. It only covers the individual because it says personal. Secondly, you need them to make sure they wear it properly. So there's an element of that can go wrong. And then also, um, it's not a collective approach. We should be looking at collective measures. So if there is a damping system built into that saw, still saw or otherwise, uh, or a grinder as it may be, then it means that no, whoever uses it, it's safer and therefore the likelihood is reduced. So we, we look at all of these variations on how we can evaluate the chance as such. Now, the <coughs> consequence as such, we've got to manage that as well. And we've got to look at likelihood and put that in side by side with the severity and consequence. And it could be minor, major or fatal. So uh, the outcome could be a cup of coffee spraying onto a laptop or a, a keyboard and there's minor damage and it's a little bit of inconvenience, but you clean it up and you replace the keyboard and then you're back to normal. It could be a broken limb as a result of um, a, the trip hazard we saw before, or it could be the grinding that's being used and the, the wheel breaks as this guy from Leeds uh, suffered a couple of years ago and it ended up and it in his face, he had safety glasses, but in the deflection of the exploded wheel itself, it also hit him in the jaw, as you can see there. Or it could be fatal, as you can see in the picture on the bottom left-hand side there, where somebody's unconscious and perhaps there's nobody coming to their aid fast enough. And therefore, as part of our control measures, what do we do for loan workers? What do we do for them? And also what, what happens in terms of first aid after the event. So it all this links together with part of our general risk management, but we take account of it and put appropriate controls in place. And therefore, we end up doing this do, 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 kind of combination of juggling as such in terms of prioritizing what needs to be done and how it's done. So the calculation takes account of the combination of the likelihood of a hazardous event occurring and the consequences of that event, yeah, likelihood and severity. We put the calculation together in quantifying the level of risk. So risk equals the likelihood multiplied by the consequence to come up with the overall rating of risk. Quite often, particularly in high risk environments, you need to have a systematic and thorough approach to this. And I'll come back to that and maybe in the next session to, to get us to consider high risk activities and, and where we can potentially go wrong. So think about the last module that you've just done in terms of learning from disasters. If those risks weren't managed as effective as they, they could be, then we need to learn from that and make sure that we take account of it to manage future risks. So the LEAP approach, LEAP, is considered in by some companies as part of their approach to listing the work tasks. So where are you doing it? What is the location and what does that pose? So it might be you've got a big drop at the side of you and therefore you'll fall a significant distance. Or it might be that you're up on a ladder, you could fall a significant distance. Or it could just be that you're remote away from anybody else and you're a lone worker and therefore makes you think differently. <clears throat> 
The equipment that you use, for some it's simplistic equipment, hand tools and likes of. For others, it could be complex machinery, computer numerical control machinery, or big heavy presses, or it could be a chainsaw. And as a result of that, that equipment poses higher risks. And then there's the activity that you're doing. Where are you going with it? What are you doing? What are the environmental factors? Um, who does it involve? Where do they move about from? Are there any restrictions in that and so on and so forth? So you look at the activity you're doing as well. And then people, every individual is slightly different. And you have to, in some cases, think about the level of risk for maybe somebody's got a health condition and therefore as a result of that condition, they have to change or we have to change in controlling that to, ident to identify and manage it effectively. So the agency have put these five steps together to help us. There are many different ways that companies do uh, risk assessments. But nevertheless, the majority of them follow the five step and the variations. I also have a six step approach, but it tends to cover the key issues. So quite often they're obvious, like, you know, a man on a ladder. It's quite obvious that he could fall. Therefore, you can identify falls from height being a hazard there. Uh, but not all of them are foreseen and not all of them are ob obvious. So risk assessments are needed for the foreseeable risks. And that again is posed in, in the interpretation of regulation three of the management regulations when we stipulate. Uh, so what, what do we consider to be foreseeable? Well, I'm, I'm sure when you see this, I'm sure you will say, well, this was definitely foreseeable because in terms of access to the cellar area, which was behind the bar, and you've got four, five, or six people working behind the bar, that there should be something in place that would prevent that. Because surely that was so obvious that at some point, um, a person working on the till or distracted by others is going to step back. And by stepping back, they're going to fall and injure themselves. Maybe we need better controls in place. So if you risk assess that, you would say, well, perhaps when the, the door comes up, it also brings up another latch and another system here that, that brings in a protection system so they can't fall up over it. Or there's some improved communication system that says maybe a, a, a verbal or an alarm system that warns them that while they're working there and the, the hatch is up, that they need to take care. And that lady might have turned around and said, oh, the hatch is up um, because they heard the uh, audible warning. Whatever it may be, make it obvious. Uh, and therefore, risk assessments need to be uh, a management approach to taking care of aspects in the workplace. Uh, estimate the risk. Think about who is at risk, how likely they are, the hazard to be event to occur, what's the likely outcome, and then build that into our risk assessment approach. So when we look at this one, it could be that we think, how likely is it to, for somebody to fall off a ladder? Now, if it's a brand new ladder and it's fiberglass and it's just been labelled up and inspected, then you'd probably say it's fairly low risk in terms of likelihood. But what about the competence of people? What about if you've got the other end of this, where you've got a ladder that used to be OK, but it's been left in the stores for a while and we should, we should have got rid of it, but it's still there. And then somebody comes along one day and there's three or four rungs missing, but they think, I could still reach to where I need to, but I stand on it, it completely falls apart. So whatever we provide as a control measure, it must remain fit for purpose. There must be a reporting procedure in place that says when it's not fit for purpose, take it out of commission, replace it or repair it. So there's these aspects as well that get built into risk management, not necessarily always in the risk assessment process, but it's part of the safety management system that people will know, and it becomes a behavioral aspect, that when they identify these issues, whether or not as they should be, something is done about it to prevent people being put unnecessary at risk. Now, I'm using the IOSH approach here because they used to uh, use this a classic example of how likely is it somebody might fall off a ladder? And then you link it next to what's the potential consequence. And the, the simple answer is how high are they up the ladder? You know, the consequence will be lower uh, as you're near the bottom, but likely otherwise, if it's designed, fitted, and it does the job, then it's unlikely. Therefore, you'd put it in the low risk. But you move towards high risk, as, as you can see there in terms of when the damage is or when it's not fit for purpose. And then you think about the environment then, high wind conditions, 
heavy weather conditions, slippery surfaces, and so on. So when you put all that together, it affects us in terms of evaluation of likelihood. And then the severity literally is, as I was saying there, well, it could be I fall, how far can they fall? And as a result of that, you would quantify that when they're working lower down or low, lower ladders, there's less impact and therefore you're leaning towards medium to low. Whereas if you're on a tall ladder, because of the distance they can fall, you might be going towards a, a higher risk. And for some people, they would argue that their employer would say, we're going to ban the use of ladders on our site because of the number of people that have died as a result of falling from height. Interestingly, though, there's only a small amount of people that actually die falling off ladders. The majority of falls are from through fragile roofs and off uh, unprotected platforms. So, but nevertheless, it, it's one of those things in terms of interpretation. So when you start to go through this quantification approach, you have to then put numbers against them. And if you have a one, two, three approach for low, medium to high, you multiply them together and you end up with a, a matrices or a matrix. The high risk is, in this case, the nine. Uh, and some would say that's very high. But let's look at six and nine being high risk. The medium risk would be the threes and fours. So that when you quantify them, put them two together, it becomes a medium risk in the yellow. And then the green area is the low risk where we quantify it as being one and two. So that's basically a quantification approach to risk matrix. But the important thing after that is to then take account of the calculations and then do something about it. So what does that mean? What action are we going to take as a result of that? So we've got to use the matrices to then uh, talk about the action that we do. So for a high risk, you might stop the work and tackle that straight on immediately. You might put it as a high priority to get it sorted out. Or you might say, we're not going to do that job for a while now until we've got adequate resources and investment to make it as safe as it possibly can be. So it helps us to work out that level of risk associated with priority as to what we're going to do to make it as safe as it needs to be. It categorizes the likelihood of the harm and severity, and then it plots our approach along a matrix to be able to then make decisions and control the risk. And that's ultimately what we're trying to do is use it as a means of prioritizing and then taking it forward. So this is typically what it might look like if you've got a one to nine approach. And uh, if you've got a low risk, you kind of carry on and just monitor. If you've got a medium risk, you might consider some improvements. And if you've got high risk, you might go to the extent of not doing it and putting improvements in place immediately if you've got the time and resources and the budget to be able to do that. Or you'll say we're not doing that activity for a while until we've got everything we need. So it allows that to take place. Now, in the step four, it says record it. So once you've done your risk assessment, put it down on a standardized approach. It can be electronic. It can be uh, a written form. But ultimately, people need to know about it and then how to use the controls. And that's why the third bullet point controls are in place. And are they good enough? You constantly ask that question. And that might be a need to review your risk assessment in step five, because what you originally planned to do with your control measures, things have changed. So a significant change would require the review of a risk assessment. Typically, that's what is expected within the detail. It would say what the risk assessment is all about in the top three, but the HSC also expect the details of the assessor, the date the risk assessment was done, and a date for when you're going to review that risk assessment. And that, for some companies, as I said earlier, could be annually or three yearly, or it could be daily based on the fact that risks are so fluid and change so frequently. So specify that. I myself have been put up, I think it was, I'll say three, three occasions when I've been pulled up were the, the date on the review and I've gone past the last time that I'd done the risk assessment review. Um, so when the HSC looked at it and the environmental health looked at it, they said, this is out of date, you should have reviewed it. And I said, quite right, I didn't get around to doing it, I'll do it straight away. Now, if you have that kind of approach, it's unlikely going to take action because you're going, going to be positive about it. But if it's led to a serious injury or fatality, they're going to look down on, on it and say, well, you should have reviewed it sooner to make sure the controls were accurate. So bear that in mind that in higher risk environments that you'll be using these uh, risk assessment techniques and various models, should we say, which I'll talk about in, in the next sessions, 
that it is important to have that kind of approach whereby if it says that we will review it every year, then we will review it. So step five is the need to review uh, your findings and your risk assessment. If there's a reason to suspect that the assessment is no longer valid, you need to review it and make it up to date. So perhaps you're doing it differently or perhaps someone's had an accident or maybe there's been change in the way you put your control measures in or the way in which you work. All of those are typical examples that would specify that it's no longer valid and therefore you need to do a new or revised risk assessment. So as I was saying before in the information, um, you can see from the example there <coughs> that um, it's got the review date on it. So I've highlighted it inside a bubble, but it also has that typical approach. Um, and you also need to rate the risk. Quite a lot of risk assessments I've seen, they haven't rated the risk. So here, um, I hope you can see my cursor, but in the middle of that column there, it says existing level of risk. And we've put a medium risk. And then when you put all your extra control measures in, control measures specified, further action needed, by who and by when, and then you've re-rated the risk. So you've gone from a medium risk down to a low risk. That shows progression, and that means that if it continues to be good, then we don't have to worry about it. So just monitor it. But it specifies to an outsider, uh, an enforcement agency as such, or an inspector, that when they see that, they say, well, you're obviously taking it seriously, you're taking account of the risks in your workplace, and it looks as though you know what you're doing. And perhaps it was just unfortunate that it led to an accident on this occasion. And that's why they're investigating it. But it may not, you know, the, certainly for myself with COVID, I've had um, environmental health and HC inspectors on six of my clients. And on two occasions, they've given us further advice. And on the other four, they've just said, I'll leave it, I'll walk away from it. So it may be that you want to argue with the enforcer and say that we feel we're doing enough. If, you, if you're in a position where your risk assessments are up to date and everything's as it should be, in your opinion, you're certainly on a strong footing. But the, the downside to this is you're on a back foot if you've not done the risk assessments or if your risk assessments are out to date or they're deficient in the control measures that should be. So it's, it's pro and react, isn't it? It's, it's a combination of both that makes it effective or ineffective. So I'll use my example here, just trying to show you what we mean by uh, this. The only time I've seen this was on a Batman 1969, I think it was, where he had his bat repellent spray on his Batman belt, um, whereby um, there was a helicopter, a diver was uh, coming out of the water. The, dive, uh, the shark attached himself to the diver and then the shark repellent spray managed to get rid of the uh, attached shark as such. Um, the only advice I give to people who are ever in this situation is, is punch the shark in the eye, and that may have uh, the desired result. But this is just a picture that's been made up. It's not true, it's not real at all, uh, no matter what anybody else might say to you, it's just a made up picture. Okay, so a bit of my Jaws uh, theme, theme tune going on there. Uh, to support it. So hazard, anything that can cause harm, I'm seeing the shark. The risk is how likely is it that someone will be harmed by the hazard? And there you are, the fisherman punching it in the eye to try and uh, stop the attack. So if I do the five steps, identify the hazard, first of all, anything that may cause harm, the shark. Secondly, who can be armed? I'm going to say the fisherman or the diver. Uh, thirdly, assess the risk, and this is the biggest part of any risk assessment. What have we done so far? What more do we need to do? Where are we up to? Have we effectively controlled it? So we're trying to prevent that from happening, somebody being eaten by a shark. And it may mean that if they have to go in the water, you put them inside a cage, uh, a shark retarding cage, should we say, that if, if they did try to attack, you've got some physical barrier in between you. But the key thing about step four is to record that these are our control measures. This is what we've done about it. And this is uh, proof of how we are managing that particular risk. And then there's the, as I said before, step five is always to consider about revising risk assessments when they're necessary or it's no longer valid. So if sharks evolve to the extent that they can use their 
I'll say flippers, that's probably not the right, or the fins, to be able to use keys and then open up a cage, then at that point, you would probably say this risk assessment is no longer valid. But nevertheless, it's just a funny way of just showing that a, a, a particular risk can be effectively controlled until it needs reviewing. So, but ultimately, how likely is it that you're ever going to come across this? And therefore, many would say what severity wise is death against likelihood being highly unlikely. When you put the two together, it may be a medium or even a low risk, dependent on the way in which you quantify it. And that's that's the real reason why I put this one together, though, is some people would quantify risks differently. Some would say because of the unlikely lack, uh, chance of this happening, then it's low risk. So think about electricity. Electricity is all around us, but it's unlikely we're ever going to have an electric shock that would be fatal because it's well protected. Or is it? And therefore, you've got to establish what the existing controls are before you rate that risk, because ultimately it's a fatality. But most people would say low risk. <clears throat> now, point of note, the uh, code of practice, which I'm going to refer to, um, L21 was very, very good. However, it was considered to be too prescriptive to employees. There was too much of a challenge, should we say, for employees to comply with it. When deregulation came about, uh, about eight years ago now, it resulted in this particular code of practice being taken out, and then the HSC had to provide more specific guidance in particular industries and areas to help companies to comply rather than relying on the word that was in the code of practice. Now, bear in mind, it has a special legal position, and therefore, if it's written into the code of practice, it then can be inferred as the legal standard. So that was one of the reasons why it was taken out. So as you can see, you know, just quickly go through. If you see uh, the word regulation and then the number at the side, it then will specify what that regulation is. Typically, the regulation is written in italics, and it has a heading. So where it says regulation five, health and safety arrangements, and then just below that, you've got it written in italics, that is the regulation. On the left then, you've got the ACOP, A-C-O-P, approved code of practice. So we see 32, and then it's written in bold. That means that's an interpretation of how you can match that standard, and it has that quasi-legal status. And then below that, you have guidance as an interpretation. So bear that in mind, because I use them all the time, but I, I sometimes forget that people aren't reading legislation as much as I do, and therefore the perhaps they don't know the ins and outs of it. So regulation three is the one that stipulated the need for risk assessment, and it went into detail about the need for it to be suitable and sufficient. Uh, and within the code of practice as was, it actually gave us a description of what that meant. Um, the risks to health and safety of his employees, and then part B was the risk to health and safety of persons not in their employment, so it covered a variety of different people. And for the purpose of identifying the measures, he needs to comply to take, sorry, to take to comply with the requirements of prohibitions imposed upon him by or under other relevant legislation. So they've used what was in place. So think about this, it came out in 1992, and then they mentioned the 1997 fire precautions regulations because there was a need there to do risk assessments on, on fire. And, and when you have the fire hazard in place, that was in legislation at the time. But now that's been superseded by the regulator for fire safety or law. Number two, every self-employed person shall make a suitable and sufficient assessment of risk. Now, there you go. It says they have to do a risk assessment, but the difference is they might not have to record it. Um, it says the word shall. I've been asked this question so many times. Um, therefore, if it's a duty that says shall, it's, it's an absolute duty, and therefore they must do it. There's no getting around it. So if there it says, section, sorry, regulation three, subsection two, every self-employed person shall make a suitable sufficient assessment of the risk to his own health and safety, and then the risk to the health and safety of others in connection with what they do. For the purpose of identifying the measures they need to take to comply with the requirements and prohibitions of pub, in, by or under relevant statute provisions. So that bit is exactly the same as three subsection one. 
Yeah, the wording is exactly the same, other than it specifies in that about the fire precautions. Uh, three, three, any assessment such as is referred to in paragraph one or two shall be reviewed by the employer or self-employed person who made it if, so all it's saying is review, they need to review it in particular circumstances, the circumstances being no longer valid or significant change. Subsection four, so regulation three, subsection four states, an employer shall not employ a young person unless he has in relation to the risks taking account of the young person's potential to go wrong and therefore risk assessments have to be done for them. In making, in 535, in making or reviewing the assessment of an employer who employs or is to employ a young person shall particularly take account of immaturity, fitting out a layer of the workstations, the workplace, the nature and degree and the form range, etc. So this is what we covered before. You can see there though, it's exactly as was in uh, regulation three, subsection five. And then when the employer employs five or more employees, he shall record it. So that's the difference between the self-employed, they have to do the risk assessment, but they're not obliged to record it. And that's my answer. When people ask me that question, that's the answer that I give them. The significant findings of the assessment, any group of his employees identified who are associated with the risk or at risk have to be made notified of it. Now, for me, Consultation is a very important part of making sure that a risk assessment becomes a successful, not just document, but way of working. Because if you don't collectively engage them with these risk assessments, there might be other practices going on that you're not aware of. And therefore, is it going to be used? Is it going to be applied? Are the controls accurate? Or are you more likely to see that they've found a different way of doing it? Shortcuts? bypassed safety controls and so on. So by engaging with them, they have the opportunity to say, well, that's not the way I do it. How about doing it this way? And looking at that side of the argument and then saying, well, based on safety controls and typical industry standards, I like what you're saying, or they might say, well, no, I can't because of. So at least get them involved, consult with them to, to then get to the stage of being able to identify and apply it. It's a requirement. You know, if you think about the variations of two pieces of legislation, we have the safety reps regs, 1977, and we had the employee regulations, 1996. So one was for unionized companies, the other was for those who didn't recognize unions, but nevertheless, you need to consult, engage, and communicate. Suitable and sufficient risk assessments. It wasn't defined, it defined in the regulation itself. It required the ACOP to give us a little bit of meat on the bones to explain it. Um, use it, and once you've got it, ignore insignificant risks and then ignore risks associated with life in general to be able to interpret it properly. Sophistication of risk assessments is determined by the level of risk. Small businesses with simple hazards, straightforward, no complex skills needed, lower risk. Larger businesses have to take uh, more time, effort and resources to make it right, analyze it perhaps more deeply, and as a result of that, make sure they take account of the best practice. So in the old ACOP, it said what suitable and sufficient was. Uh, the risk assessment should identify the risks arising from or in connection with work. Uh, the level of detail in the risk assessment should be proportioned to the risk. Once the risks are assessed and taken into account, insignificant risk can it be ignored, as can risks arising out of normal working life, unless the work activity compounds on significantly alters these risks. So it's that collective use of. So it could be people going past on a regular basis, and there's the risk, and a result of maybe a crane arm coming out more than it normally would do, and then putting people at risk underneath it. Yeah, they're just passing by. But if you if they if you bypass your control measures and put people at risk, then it needs to be. Uh, improved and in order to be considered suitable and sufficient. Small businesses presenting few or simple hazards, suitable and sufficient risk can be a very straightforward process based on informed judgments. So they don't have to go to the extent of a full blown risk assessment process. And like I said, if they're less than five employees, they don't even have to record it, but they need to stand in court and explain their situation. 
employers should try to help themselves look at guidance, legislation, trade literature, etc., to find out what the industry standard is and best practice. They can only deal with foreseeable risk because you're not expected to look outside of that. It must consider non-employees, visitors, subcontractors, contractors, maintenance engineers, so on, um, and, and members of the public. So it goes into quite some detail when we identify what they could be. And if you look at number three, though, and you, what jumps out to me is, is coma, you know, an environment where it's dangerous or it's high risk, then you'd have to make sure that the risk control measures are more identifiable and also the specific risk assessment is very detailed to talk about the controls and the arrangements. So an interpretation of suitable and sufficient is always one that I can debate a long, long time. Record significant findings, as I mentioned before. So putting it in down in writing or electronically so that people know what to do and how to apply it. Available for inspectors, available for safety reps to enable review and to talk about how it can be approved upon um, are all part of what needs to be in, implemented in there. And think about everything within your risk assessment. I mentioned before about uh, young uh, mothers, expectant mothers, new mothers, and the controls are in place for that. So I won't go on that again, but there is the link there to the the certificate that's needed that actually says that they are pregnant and then whether they might need to be suspended. For me, it's a bit like um, a fit note. You know, if somebody, there's three aspects of a fit note, not fit to work, uh, fit to work with restrictions and then fit to work. You know, so there's three options. It's usually the, the middle one that you would class for someone who's pregnant or a returning mother as such when we come back after maternity. So you think about fitting them into that category. Young persons, as I mentioned earlier, that's uh, vulnerable people and therefore what's needed for them. And then there's lots, it's not just this one, there's lots of information out there to help us. Now, if you look at uh, prosecutions, you can go onto the HSC's website. Uh, they've got this conviction section. Um, I did a search and found four that were up there in 2021. Uh, and then I, I went into interrogated a little bit further. If you look at the one at the bottom, number four, so the Alpha Plus Limited one in May of this year, um, Regulation 3 1. So that tells me that they've been found in breach of Regulation 3, as is the case with uh, 3D's mining. They were in breach of Regulation 3. So that says that either they hadn't done a risk assessment or the risk assessment itself wasn't suitable and sufficient. So I'll, I've gone into more detail to try and find the, the details of the case and the breaches. And when you look at the breach in this case, um, it said that they were guilty and they had a fine of £75,000. And again, it stipulates Regulation 3.1. So they hadn't done a suitable and sufficient risk assessment. That led to a serious injury and that's why they prosecuted. So to give you a couple of examples, um, this case here, a 57 year old uh, man was carrying out maintenance on a printing machine. As a result of that, uh, the engineer's index finger was severely injured because it was drawn in. They'd removed uh, one of the control measures, we call it a finger nip guard, and allowed the rollers to turn around. So imagine two rollers going round. In that nip point in the middle, there should be a guard going across it so that your hand cannot be drawn in. And in this case, because he needed access to it for maintenance purposes, he'd taken that guard off and the company had allowed him to do that, hadn't questioned it. And as a result of that, he had the accident. Uh, when he returned, it appeared the rollers were no longer running and he went to check the texture of the ink. As he leant over, the rollers started moving again and his fingers were pulled in. So that's um, you know, issues around maintenance. We have a lot of accidents from maintenance activities and usually it's the, the lack of adequate safety controls and sometimes engineers being engineers taking the risk that they shouldn't do. So this prosecution should remind other employers that failing to keep their employees safe can have serious consequences and they will be held accountable for this failure. But in the earlier section it says that the, the risk assessment was not suitable and sufficient. As is the next example, six and a half million pound fine here, uh, for an 11 year old boy that uh, died as a result of this freight terminal accident. 
Um, so as you can see, they fell to his death in that respect. But if we look at the, um, died in June 20, 2017, when he easily gained access to the depot, you know, the easily bits standing out there with his friends to retrieve a football and was able to climb on top of a station of freight wagon where he received a fatal electric shock from the overhead line. He was pronounced dead at the scene despite efforts from paramedics. So what they're basically saying, as you can see in the bold there, is that it was too easy for that child to get up there and put themselves at risk. So failing to undertake a suitable and sufficient risk assessment because they didn't identify the risk and put controls in place to minimize access to it. So every case is an individual case, but what they can refer to are other cases of similar types that have happened in the past. And they'll use that to prove that what, that what is expected in the industry and therefore you didn't match that expectation. In contesting this trial, the defendant failed to take responsibility for a serious mm -hmm. and obvious mm -hmm. failing to allow public access to what is and was a dangerous environment. That's the perception of the risk. Now, the company themselves will probably argue that they'd taken account of the foreseeable risks of employees and people working on the site, but failed in the fact that they didn't consider that an 11 year old would come and try and retrieve a football because they were playing football next to the perimeter fence and the area where they could easily access and get through the control measures. So again, is it fair? Should they have done more? down to the company and, and legislation perhaps to indicate. I'm going to move on now to a big part of risk management and risk assessments is in our consideration of managing risk, we should consider the hierarchy of control. And the legislation is built around this. So if you look at work at heights as an example, manual handling as an example, COSH as an example, where it says, um, don't do it, avoid it, eliminate it wherever possible. So don't manually handle, don't carry hazardous substances, don't use hazardous substances, don't work at height unless it's absolutely necessary. So that question has got to come up first in your level of risk management. Can we do this in a different way that doesn't put them at risk and therefore eliminates that particular hazard? What I will specify that by eliminating some hazards, and the classic one for this is manual handling, you might then say, oh, we'll put it on a pallet and then we'll use a forklift truck. Well, when you do that, you've certainly eliminated the risk of manual handling or you've reduced it, but you've introduced a brand new risk, which is probably from a severity point of view, much more nasty. But nevertheless, uh, it's something you have to build into your equation of what we can do to eliminate or mitigate the risks. Substitution, use something less hazardous, do something differently, or um, rather than using that nasty substance, can we use um, something that's less volatile and therefore less impact? So, so bleach is a classic example that gets banned in many companies um, and they'll use detergents as an alternative. But can it be substituted by a safer alternative? The third one down is engineering controls and those are physical activities they're expected to reduce risk and control risk, and then administrative behavior and PPA. So what I'm gonna do is just use that as an explanation on each one. So elimination, gone through that, or substitute. Yeah, so rather than using ladders, you might use a mobile elevator work platform. Engineering controls, use work equipment or other measures to prevent falls where you can't avoid working at height. So install or use additional machinery such as LEV to control the risk from dust or fumes. So all these thoughts are ways of looking at how you can do things differently, but engineering controls are used heavily, should we say, to control that risk to several people rather than just the individuals. Administrative controls, well, it's more than what it's saying in terms of admin here. Um, it's more about how to maintain that it remains fit for purpose. So it might be reducing the time that people are exposed to risk or stopping people from going to certain areas so that only a number of people are exposed to that risk or stop the use of uh, mobile phones, which could be distracting or it could be an ignition source in an explosive environment. Um, increasing the signage 
in the area. So it reminds people of the control measures and the level of risk there, and also that performance of risk assessment is necessary to oversee that administrative controls. Now, behaviour is next line, but it's an area that I feel that the Health and Safety Board spends a lot of time either working with individuals to monitor and change the way that they do things, or to get line managers and managers and supervisors to take on board their responsibilities. So I'll go back to the Health and Safety Work Act section two, information instruction, training and supervision. And that fourth one there means what we're trying to do is monitor that unsafe acts don't come about, but at the same time, avoiding things like unsafe conditions. And we may focus on that by looking at the way that people work. The usual example I use is a faultless truck driver. I have an observation checklist for uh, watching a uh, faultless truck driver to be to see when they're reversing, for example, how many times do they look in the direction of travel? When they're moving along in a roadway, what is the position of the forks in terms of the travel position, as we call it, and whether it could be putting them or others at risk? So perhaps rather than it being low down so they can see where they're going, maybe they've elevated the forks and they can't see um, and so on. Or maybe they're traveling with the load in front of them and what they should be doing is reversing and turning in the direction of travel so they can see where they're going. So there's things that you can see about behaviors quite often and behavioral safety management is, a, is, a, is an area of science in itself that I could spend days talking about in terms of managing risk more effectively. But ultimately what we're trying to do is prevent those unsafe acts and in some cases control and avoid those unsafe conditions as well in the workplace. And then way down the hierarchy of controls is personal protective equipment because it only protects the individual and it has uh, issues, should I say, you know, by people themselves being people, they might have different approaches to risk and risk management. They might not wear it properly, it might not fit, they might have it in the wrong position, so it's not really protect them, it might not cover or seal them as it should do. Um, it might be damaged and they've not got a replacement. So it is a weakness into the control measure, but nevertheless, in certain areas, particularly with COSH, you can't just rely on the engineering controls of the behaviours. You also need gloves, gauntlets, uh, safety goggles, helmets and the likes of as well. So were the risk dictated, personal protective equipment needs to be in place as well. But I must stress, it's lower down because of those people issues and behavioural issues. So think about that in terms of the hazards. And if you put that into context with, I'm using the work at height example again, don't put people at risk, let's do it from ground level. Choose the right work equipment that makes it fit for purpose to do the job safely. Think about mitigating factors so that if they do fall, perhaps uh, they don't hit a hard surface or there's something they'll bounce off or they'll hit a net. Or maybe they were in a, a lanyard uh, that's shorter than the distance that they can drop to hit a hard surface and therefore it protects them. You know, so variations on that. Um, thinking within risk assessment, what do we have to cover? The, the height that they're working, the bigger the distance, the more the drop, the bigger the risk. The surface that they might be working on or fall onto. Um, it, does it make it a stable platform or are they using a, a ladder that could slip or move about? And lose, lose its stability. What kind of ground is it on? Can it can that in itself move? Could it be sloping, muddy, uneven, and therefore increase risk? What about the weather conditions and also the task that they're doing? The task being perhaps it leans them towards stretching out one way or the other and putting themselves at risk of a fall. So the HSC have been kind to us. They've given us plenty of guidance on this, and you can put it through a series of questions and you end up with considering all of those to then dictate whether it's a high, medium or low risk. And that goes on for many examples, particularly as you'll see in a minute, uh, if we look at COSH and if we look at manual handling, there's tools out there that the HSA have produced that make, helps employers make it easier for them to do risk evaluation and then put in place the appropriate controls. They even give us guidance and support on how to, like here, tips for safe working whilst working at height. So again, uh, there's a standard out there, um, use it. Another example, work window cleaning. If you think about it now, can you do it from the ground level? There's a lot of equipment out there, like a, a water-fed pole 
which allows people to stand on the ground and use this extended pole to reach the window. So in that respect, it makes it easy for them to do. Electrical safety is a further example of this, where we take into account particular hazards and concerns, and how we can reduce risk associated with that. And again, there's lots of information out there that we can follow the rules and get, get to where we want to be. So avoid manual handling, avoid suitable sufficient assessments, task and tile, task individual load and environment, and then put the controls in place. And look at the tools that they provided for us. It's the same kind of thing, not just for manual handling, but as I said before, cost essentials is good uh, in terms of trying to use that as a tool for assessing risk, uh, exposure to chemical agents and, and biological agents and so on. So it's out there, even if you don't use it, have a good read through it because it tells you some good ideas and you can perhaps use some of them. So just wanna finish off last couple of slides. Um, if you think about the link with risk, risk assessments as such in the common law side of things, so in civil cases, where the purpose is to look for compensation, um, three things have to be proved by the person who's, who's looking for compensation, so the claimant, a duty of care was owed to them. There was a material breach of that duty of care. And then as a result of that breach, the, the claimant was injured. So they would be looking for evidence. So in the particulars of claim that's put together for them by their solicitors, it would specify, can we have access to a copy of your risk assessment and the risk management techniques that you have used to control this particular risk? And that question is always brought up. So they want copies of that so they can then pull it to pieces. And when they look at it, they'll be saying, is that good enough? And so if you don't have it for statute reasons to comply with the law, here in civil law, you can trip yourself up again because um, if there's no risk assessment that says this is how we manage the risk, you'll end up paying up through your insurance company for that particular case. So slightly different here in terms of proof. The burden of proof changes somewhat because it rests with the claimant, the injured person, rather than the employer. But if you don't have the risk assessments and if you don't have the safety management systems and the evidence to support it, then the claimant will win. Um, so there's a, a profit reason, should we say, to, to try and manage these risks by having risk assessments in place and also a management system that takes account of it. Now, what I've done is just look at kind of what we need to do about risk assessments. I know we can pull two together, but what we also need to do over and above this is make it a live document. And that means getting together with people who are affected by the risks. So it can be discussed in the safety committee meetings, it can be a risk assessment program meeting. It can be a project meeting where it allows people to spend that time together to look at the risks and the control measures to see whether they're efficient, effective and adequate. And then there's an opportunity there to say, we need more money, we need more resources, we need better controls. And then if you don't get them straight away, they can build it in over a series of a couple of years, perhaps, to then say, we'll make sure that next year we have these in place and we have the money to be able to buy what we need and, and put effective controls in place. One of my clients now, I know they're going to have to spend something like uh, three quarters of a million pounds to have an effective extraction system for welding, you know, and they've known this for years and years, but now they've had three improvement notices and they've now got a person that's putting a compensation claim in for a lung disorder as a result of them not providing adequate controls. The overall cost of that, if it turns into prosecution, might match or indeed exceed that three quarters of a million. So I'd, it's been easier for me to argue that, to be able to say, there you go. If you don't, this is what it's going to cost. But think about the moral duty. We should not be putting people at risk anyway. And uh, let's put the extraction in. Let's put the on tool extraction in as well that will manage that particular risk. And let's train our staff up to prevent that. So um, that's the end of the first session on risk management. Sorry for teaching people to suck eggs in some respects, but nevertheless, um, I'll use the modeling and the techniques later on. But we need the grounding done first to be able to make sure we're on the right track. Thanks for your time. Take care. Speak to you soon.